COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is most often but not always associated with cigarette smoking. It has a huge impact on our population. Not only were 15 million people diagnosed with COPD in the United States in 2020, almost 12 million additional cases were probably out there that were undiagnosed. Not only is COPD widespread, but it kills a lot of people. It shocks folks whenever they first discover that the survival rates of COPD are actually worse than for many cancers. The aggregate five-year survival rate of folks with COPD has been estimated to be between 30 and 60%. And it's estimated that the two-year survival of folks diagnosed with severe COPD is only 50%. The number of deaths caused by COPD versus lung cancer in the U.S. have and continue to run neck and neck. So it's a disease I take every bit as seriously as lung cancer in my smoking patients. COPD is the number four leading cause of death in the United States and the number three leading cause of death worldwide behind only coronary heart disease and stroke. Worldwide, COPD kills almost five times more people than HIV AIDS, over twice more than diabetes, and 80% more than lung cancer every year. So what is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Let's break it down. First and foremost, COPD is a lung disease. It's an abnormal inflammatory response in the lungs that can occur from the chronic inhalation of irritants like cigarette smoke or air pollution. COPD is preventable if a person can avoid inhaling these sort of irritants. COPD is also an obstructive lung disease. When we normally breathe, air enters our lungs when we breathe in, and air leaves our lungs when we breathe out. With an obstructive lung disease, the flow of air in our lungs is impeded, especially when we're breathing out, which can make it difficult to empty the lungs normally. Finally, COPD is a chronic disease, meaning that it lasts a long time and is often a lifelong condition. COPD is a disease that's not fully reversible and can be progressive, particularly when nothing is done. Medical management and treatment can help and improve a patient's symptoms and quality of life, but probably can't get a patient 100% back to normal. Now, let's do a deeper dive so that we can develop a better appreciation for what's happening pathophysiologically in patients with COPD so that we're better informed when we approach their imaging. Air is conducted in and out of the lungs through a branching system of hollow tubes. From the trachea, these hollow tubes undergo 23 orders of branching before they reach their endpoint, one of the 250 million alveoli in the lungs. This is a zoomed in view of the airways. This is a simplified drawing. As you can see, we've illustrated only seven orders of branching in the space where 20 orders of branching would occur in real life. Airways between the trachea and alveoli are characterized as either bronchi or bronchioles. The bronchi are defined by the presence of cartilage in their walls, while bronchioles are characterized by the absence of cartilage in their walls. Bronchi are larger in diameter, fewer in number, and more central, while bronchioles are smaller in caliber, much, much more numerous, and more peripheral. The ultimate job of the bronchi and bronchioles is to conduct air in and out of the alveolar sacs. Now, the alveolar air sacs are normally stretchy and springy, they expand when we breathe in, and they passively contract back to the original size, pushing air out like a deflating party balloon when we exhale. Chronic exposure to irritants like cigarette smoke or air pollution can lead to repeated rounds of inflammation and collateral damage to the alveolar sacs, leading to the destruction of alveolar walls and their attachments, which cause the alveolar sacs to lose much of their springiness or elastic recoil. Alveolar sacs that lose their springiness have a much tougher time passively emptying air during every breath out. And we refer to this condition as emphysema. But this isn't the only harm that repeated exposure to cigarette smoke or air pollution can cause. If we move into the bronchioles, we'll see that chronic rounds of inflammation and collateral damage can also cause swelling and scarring of the bronchiolar walls and the increased secretion and accumulation of mucus within their lumens, leading to a much, much smaller channel for air to flow through, and a condition we refer to as obstructive bronchiolitis. And that's not all. Have you wondered how all these bronchiolar tubes stay open 
when they don't have a cartilage scaffolding or ring in their walls. The bronchioles stay open because they live in a bed of 250 million springy alveolar sacs, which help tether their lumens open. However, if you've got emphysema going on, the alveolar sacs are less springy and do a worse job of tethering the bronchioles open, which can make the airflow problem in the bronchioles even worse. The effects of cigarette smoke or air pollution also impact the bronchi. Chronic inflammation can lead to bronchial wall swelling and increased mucus secretion and accumulation, which we call chronic bronchitis, which impairs airflow centrally, further impeding someone's attempts to empty air out of their lungs. Looking at the big picture, chronic exposure to irritants like cigarette smoke and air pollution can impair a person's ability to push air out of their lungs at different levels as chronic bronchitis in the bronchi, obstructive bronchiolitis in the bronchioles, and emphysema in the alveolar sacs. Conceptually, you'll see that we will often lump obstructive bronchiolitis under chronic bronchitis, leading to the two familiar COPD buckets we first learned in medical school. Now, let's illustrate the relationship between COPD and another very common obstructive lung disease, asthma. So we've established that chronic exposure um, to irritants like cigarette smoke and air pollution can lead to emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Um, I've drawn these as partially overlapping sets um, since. Some patients um, may only develop emphysema, some patients may only develop chronic bronchitis, and some patients may develop both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Now, in some folks, the emphysema or chronic bronchitis may be so mild that the patient is asymptomatic and undetectable perhaps on tests like spirometry. While in other folks, the airflow obstruction is detectable on testing and or the patient is symptomatic. It's these folks who I'll refer to as having COPD. So where does asthma fit? I think of asthma as this green set. With some folks who are basically asymptomatic um, and other folks with asthma who are symptomatic. This leads to our complete Venn diagram of obstructive lung disease and helps illustrate how we'll encounter some patients who have symptomatic asthma but no COPD and other patients who may have COPD and asthma. Now, Let's talk about the management and treatment strategies for folks with COPD. Treatment strategies for COPD basically bifurcate according to phenotype. Chronic bronchitis is usually managed pharmacologically with treatments like bronchodilators and inhaled steroids, while emphysema is more often managed with supplemental oxygen and in a subset of patients surgically. Now, when a patient first presents to their healthcare provider, they don't arrive in the office saying, hello doc, I have symptom, symptomatic COPD caused by chronic bronchitis without emphysema, but rather they'll present with a history, physical examination, and perhaps spirometry that might inform a provider that there's somewhere inside the white box we call airflow obstruction, or perhaps even in the purple region of that white box we call COPD. However, it can be tough to get more specific than that based on history, physical examination, and spirometry alone. And getting more specific is important, since the two phenotypes of COPD, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, tend to call for different management and treatment strategies, amongst other things. And what if that patient who you think has COPD actually has something else? That's where CT imaging can sometimes help, providing some objective evidence that can inform and increase a referring provider's confidence regarding which particular COPD phenotypes, uh, phenotypes may be at play in a patient and how bad it looks. So what kind of structural evidence are we looking for on a CT to help? Let's start with chronic bronchitis, which is traditionally diagnosed clinically in patients with a chronic cough that lasts for at least three consecutive months in at least two consecutive years. Observing the presence of bronchial wall thickening can increase our confidence 
that chronic bronchitis may be at play in our patient with COPD. Bronchial wall thickening is obviously not 100% specific for COPD only, but in a patient with COPD can support the presence of this phenotype. Now, with mild cases of bronchial wall thickening, there can be some variation um, between observers or sometimes within the same observer, which has prompted some folks to propose more quantitative CT analyses um, in the literature. But these aren't always that practical in a real world busy reading room. So I tend to rely on a simpler method a colleague taught me. Compare the thickness of the bronchial wall to the thickness of a normal fissure, like the right major fissure in this example. And think about invoking bronchial wall thickening if the bronchial wall appears thicker than the fissure. It's a fast, relatively objective, and convenient shortcut. If you happen to be reading a high-res or ILD protocol chest CT with inspiratory and expiratory series, obstructive bronchiolitis in a patient with COPD may present as air trapping on the expiratory phase images. In normal patients with no air trapping, air is pushed out of all of the lungs during expiration, resulting in lungs that appear diffusely whiter on expiration and smaller in volume compared to the inspiratory images. While in a patient with COPD and air trapping, we might observe scattered geographic regions of lung that remain almost as black on inspiration as on inspiration because the air can't efficiently escape on the expiratory maneuver. This can result in a mosaic attenuation pattern if intervening regions of more normal lung are still present, regions that will appear whiter on expiratory um, imaging since the air might still be able to escape more normally there. Finally, CT imaging can help confirm the presence of the emphysema phenotype in patients with COPD. And the two subtypes of emphysema we'll usually encounter will be centrilobular emphysema and paraseptal emphysema. In central lobular emphysema, we'll see multiple localized regions of markedly low lung attenuation representing lung destruction that fall below 950 Hounsfield units. These areas or regions of low attenuation, of markedly low attenuation, can range from tiny to quite large in size. Um, they're relatively evenly distributed on an axial CT um, image of the lung um, in most cases. On a good quality CT study, you might be able to spy a tiny centrilobular vessel in many of these regions of markedly low lung attenuation. That represents the lobular pulmonary artery at the center of a lobule um, within these low attenuation regions. Centrilobular emphysema will usually exhibit a predominantly upper lung distribution, but becomes increasingly diffuse in more severe cases. In 2015, the Fleischmann Society proposed grading the severity of centrilobular emphysema into five buckets. Trace centrilobular emphysema, in cases where centrilobular emphysema lucencies involve under half a percent of the total lung volume. Mild centrilobular emphysema, in cases where the centrilobular emphysema lucencies involve up to 5% of the total lung volume and remain separated from each other by large regions of normal lung. Moderate centrilobular emphysema, in cases where central lobular emphysema lucencies remain separated from each other uh, by regions of normal lung, but involve more than 5% of the total lung volume. Confluent central lobular emphysema, in cases where the central lobular emphysema lucencies begin to coalesce into larger regions, but with no architectural distortion or vessel splaying. And finally, advanced destructive central lobular emphysema, where the large lucent regions begin to distort the lung and splay pulmonary vessels, like in this example and in this example. Other groups have proposed alternative ways of characterizing the severity of central lobular emphysema too. One method involves looking at three CT slices from the upper, mid, and lower lung and estimated the percent of emphysematous lung involvement at each of the three levels, which I find to be a bit slower and time consuming than the Fleischner method and quantitative CT methods uh, using software tools that threshold lung regions um, um, below a certain uh, uh, attenuation value and uh, permit the reporting of a percent of emphysematous lung, their lobar distribution, and the size of the emphysematous foci. 
Unlike centrilobular emphysema, the lucencies of paraseptal emphysema occur along the lung margins um, and often are aligned in a row. The Fleischner Society supports grading the severity of paraseptal emphysema into two buckets, mild paraseptal emphysema for cases where the paraseptal emphysema lucencies along the lung margins are under one centimeter, and substantial paraseptal emphysema for cases where the paraseptal emphysema lucencies along the lung margins are over one centimeter. These are the sort of cases that particularly can predispose patients to spontaneous pneumothoraces. In addition to the CT um, imaging findings that directly correspond to the specific phenotypes of COPD, sometimes we'll encounter findings that have been known to correlate with a diagnosis of COPD. Um, tracheal disorders like tracheobronchomalacia and saber chief trachea, large airway disorders like bronchiectasis, small airway disorders like respiratory bronchiolitis and pulmonary arterial enlargement in patients where chronic COPD has led to pulmonary arterial hypertension. Tracheobronchomalacia is defined as an at least 80% reduction in the tracheal luminal cross-sectional area on expiratory imaging compared to inspiratory imaging. So it's going to be a diagnosis we'll tend to make um, on high-res ILD protocol chest CTs, uh, where we've obtained both an inspiratory and an expiratory phase um, series. We can suspect the presence of tracheomalacia sometimes in the absence of expiratory phase imaging when the trachea exhibits an open fish mouth or biconcave shape. We encounter tracheobronchomalacia in around 20% of patients with COPD, though in the majority of these cases, the tracheomalacia may not be correlated with any physiologic impairment. Saber sheaf trachea is nearing of the trachea in the transverse plane and typically invoked when the AP diameter of the trachea appears over 50% greater than the transverse diameter of the trachea. Bronchiectasis is irreversible bronchial dilation. We'll invoke bronchiectasis on CT imaging when we're confident the phenomenon is chronic, since reversible bronchial dilation can occur in some other patients. Some of the CT imaging features we're looking for are if the bronchial lumen appears equal or greater in diameter than its accompanying pulmonary artery, an absence of bronchial caliber tapering as the bronchus courses peripherally, and the presence of a visible airway within a centimeter of pleural surface. Respiratory bronchiolitis is a smoking-related small airways disease that can present as a diffuse fine centrolobular nodular interstitial pattern or as a diffuse isolated ground glass pattern in more severe cases. Finally, pulmonary arterial enlargement may occur when pulmonary arterial hypertension has developed as a consequence of COPD and chronic diffuse hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Presuming the ascending aorta is not aneurysmal, folks generally invoke pulmonary arterial enlargement when the pulmonary artery diameter is larger than the ascending thoracic aorta or when the main pulmonary artery reaches a diameter of 30 millimeters. These thresholds are based off of the Framingham Heart Study, which established normative main pulmonary artery, um, pulmonary artery diameter reference values of 29 millimeters in men and 27 millimeters in women, and a 0 0.9 diameter ratio for main pulmonary artery to ascending aorta. Putting everything together, uh, my typical chest CT reporting practices in smokers and patients with um, suspected or diagnosed COPD is to describe bronchial wall thickening if present, uh, mention the presence or absence of observed air trapping if um, the chest CT happens to be a high-res or ILD protocol study when we have inspiratory and expiratory phase images. Um, if emphysema is present, I'll try to describe the subtype, severity, and distribution. I'll also keep an eye out for and describe any of the findings often correlated with COPD, tracheobronchomalacia, saber trachea, bronchiectasis, respiratory bronchiolitis, and pulmonary arterial enlargement.